All right, everyone, Cody Don here. Welcome back to my laboratory. So, a little while ago, I made a video uh, trying to show that if you are underground, you can hear thunder through the earth before you can through the air because sound travels faster through rock than it does through most gases. And I was a little successful. However, due to the unpredictability and rareness of thunderstorms, I really didn't get to try again with a better microphone. So today I'm going to try something else. Introducing thunder in a can. Are you doing experiments with lightning and or thunder and are annoyed by the random and unpredictability of it? Well, thunder in a can is for you. Thanks to our patented magic boom powder, the acoustic energy of a lightning strike can be released at any time and location that you choose. Thunder in a can is extremely unsafe, therefore it is not legal to transport or distribute. It is further banned from public use in many states and most countries. This is a joke, not an actual product. <laughs> so yeah, I'm gonna make my own thunder. Okay, so the can is buried, just the very top of it is exposed now. I'm going to put a bag of flour over top of it, so it puts up a nice white cloud for us to see on camera. Got everything wired up. Now I'm just going to go half a mile away. Okay, let's turn this one on. Okay. So here I am, underground. I've got about 50 meters of rock above my head. There's my Yeti microphone nuzzled right up against the stone wall there. Got my laptop here recording both video and the audio from that microphone. Let me actually just uh, sync the audios. Okay. Sure that's still recording. Good to go. I guess I'm gonna head on out. Oh, a lot of muck that needs to be done in here. We go. Oh, daylight. Washing out the sensor. Let's turn that back down. So to help keep the air blast from getting to the camera underground, I've got this foam pad here that I'm going to stuff over the entrance. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, it's a little harder getting up there above ground. You gotta go up the hill. <laughs> This pile of rocks here marks where the end of that tunnel is. 50 meters straight down. Set the camera up. The boom is going to happen right about there. All right, you ready? Fire in the hole! Three, two, one. That worked! <laughs> Perfect! So, results time. You just saw what this camera picked up from above ground. Now I'm going to show you what the underground camera recorded. A little haunting, isn't it? Now I'm going to combine the audio from underground with the uh, audio and video from above ground. Two! One! From that, you can clearly hear the thunder through the ground before you can through the air. I mean, through the air, it takes a little over two seconds to travel the 715 meters. So that's about 350 meters per second. But through the ground, it travels uh, only about uh, six or seven frames of video. And I was filming at 60 frames per second. So that's something in excess of six kilometers per second, like 14 or 15 times faster than the sound traveled through the air. <laughs> like, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? So why exactly is it that the sound traveled faster through the ground than it did through the air? 
Many people will try to tell you that it's because the rock is more dense and dense materials transmit sound faster. In actuality, density has nothing to do with it. Helium is less dense in air, but if the speed of sound was slower in helium, my voice would be lower pitched instead of high pitched. Clearly that is not the case. <clears throat> No, actually what the speed of sound depends on is how fast the material can recover from deformation. Sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but it does make sense if you think about it in a terms of energy. You see, if you've got a material and you deform it and it doesn't recover, then that energy is lost. You know, that it absorbed that energy and now there's nothing for the wave to continue. In order for the wave to continue, you have to be able to recover that energy so that more deformation can occur. For a gas, that recovery means uh, the gas particles flowing back into the rarefied space. And that happens based on their average speed, which is determined by their kinetic energy and their mass. Lower mass particles with the same amount of energy will travel faster and fill that void quicker, thus producing a higher speed of sound. An example being helium. Solids, and to some lesser extent liquids, have something else going for them though. They have strong chemical bonds between the particles. So when the deformation happens, there's something to pull them right back. And in materials such as lead, where you've got a high mass and a weak bond, and the speed of sound is pretty slow. But when you've got a material such as diamond, where you've got a low mass and strong chemical bonds, such as triple bonded carbon, then that recovery is very quick, and you see very high speed of sound in diamond. The rocks and the earth are mostly oxygen, same as the air, but the oxygen in the rocks is strongly held down by chemical bonds. And that is why the speed of sound is faster through rocks than it is through the air. One more thing I'd like to point out, especially if you've got headphones on, You'll notice that the sound is not a single boom. It's more of a uh, boom boom. Or, you know, a boom and then a smaller boom shortly after. So what you're hearing is the primary and secondary waves coming through. The primary wave is basically just bumping the microphone, kind of like that. And the secondary wave is uh, shaking things around a little bit more. In this case, we picked up the primary wave a little bit better because the microphone was, you know, up against the rock and the uh, Secondary wave would have moved like this, which wouldn't have transferred very much energy to the mic. Plus the uh, thunder was producing mainly a pressure wave. The secondary uh, transverse motion was just, there wasn't very much of that generated. The gap between the two wave fronts is like five or six frames, which indicates that the secondary wave travels about half as fast. This property of seismic waves is what allows us to calculate what distance a seismometer was from an earthquake. And the reason that the secondary wave is slower is that the shear strength of a rock is less than its compressive strength. A medium that has no shear strength whatsoever, such as a gas or liquid, does not transmit the secondary wave, and thus you only see the initial pressure wave. You've got all the echoes here, but there's no secondary wave. Now someone might say that the uh, second wave front that comes through might actually be a reflection or an echo. Well. I actually took steps to avoid that. You see, the rock layers were originally laid down like this, but in the past 500 million years have been tilted up to almost vertical. And I placed the thunder can on the same rock unit. It is true that the seismic energy can reflect off of the different rock units, but with it set up like that, they're just gonna bounce back and forth, kind of like light down a fiber optic cable, therefore focusing the energy and directing it to my microphone which I did very intentionally to stack the cards in my favor. If I would have done it so that the seismic energy had to go through the rock layers, it would have caused reflections, and every time it reflects, it loses energy, and it might not have been enough to even be picked up, because, well, that microphone's just not made for this kind of thing. So, hope you learned something. I'll see you next time. I thought you guys might like to see the crater. And there it is. <laughs> A little bit wider than the hole I originally dug. Let's see, where's my, there's some paper. There's the wire. That looks good. You know what, I think I'm gonna plant a tree right there. I think that'd be cool.
I guess that's one way to loosen up the soil. 